All right, so this is the, the last segment for uh, lecture one. Um, this is going to cover 1.2 in the book, which is about sets. So let's get started with that. You probably have run into discussion of sets before. Um, the, the thing I want to emphasize for you is there's a, there literally is a difference in math anyway between the word set and the word collection. And the difference is this, if you've got a set, you have to absolutely be sure what's in it. There, there can be no question. If, if somebody shows you a thing, you go, yeah, that's in, or no, that's not in. There, there's, there's no ambiguity. Where we use the word collection, if there is some ambiguity, if maybe there's some things where we can't tell, and, and that actually happens. In fact, there's, there's sort of a new, well, relatively new, within the last hundred years, um, branch of math that deals with, with issues like that. There's certain things in math that literally cannot be decided. You can't tell. And it's, it's proved that it's impossible to know whether the thing is true or false. So whether a thing might be in a set or not becomes undecidable, in which case you talk about collection. So what we usually say to get at sets is, is this, a set is a, co a well-defined collection. And this phrase, well-defined, is trying to get that at the idea of uh, being certain whether things are in it or not. The things that are in a set uh, are called elements. And they can be weird things. They can be all kinds of crazy things. For instance, you could be, have other sets. You could, you could build a set that has sets as its elements. But uh, most often, what we're going to be thinking about is you'll have a set, and then the elements will be numbers. Um, the, the idea of a set is things are either in it or they're not in it. There's no, um, I've got multiple copies of this. Right? So, so I don't know, if you play games like Magic, for instance, it's, just, it's possible you have many, many copies of the same card. But as a set, you would just say, I've got one of that thing, or, or you know, I've got that thing. Rather than... uh, yeah, so, so a couple of issues that we need to talk about. If you had, um, let's call it S for set, S is one, two, three. And Q is three, two, one. Well, that's being silly because really these are the same collection of things. It doesn't matter what order you mention them. I'll, I'll point out that I'm doing the uh, uh, something that Implicitly, at least, I'm doing something that um, actually deserves a name. When the best way to describe a set is to just say it's equal to, and then use these French braces to lay out a set of things that are in it. Uh, in other words, if you just list everybody that's in the set, you very concretely defined it. Yeah. So uh, if you do stuff like what we done here, those are known as roster form. I don't know how I'm writing this now. Didn't leave a place to write it. And order doesn't matter. So these are really the same roster forms, even though it looks they look on the surface different. So what we've got there is an S that's the same thing as a Q. And I made the point that you can you can uh, write multiple copies of a thing down if you want, but it doesn't really influence what collection of things you've got. So if I had, uh, let, let's get a new one. Uh, S Q have an R. If R was, I've got a bunch of ones, a couple of twos, and a three. It is wasting ink. It, all you really should be writing is I've got one, I've got one, I've also got two, and I've got three. So this R that we just created, it's also the same as S and Q. So the, the upshot of these two things, that order doesn't matter, and that repeats are sort of redundant is that if you're using a computer program or you're using a you're trying to get a data structure that models what a set is well it should be an unordered collection of things with no repeats in it and there's a sort of a strange little zen you need to get used to when a collection is unordered 
That is, you don't care what order it comes in. You get to put it in whatever order you feel like. Like, um, if you've ever played Scrabble, you know, you get that little rack and you pick seven letters out of the bag and you put them on the rack. Well, you're allowed to move them around. In fact, you do just move them around. You try to assemble words out of them. Um, so if you feel like you've got that freedom to sort things around how you like, then you're talking about an unordered collection. And the best way to, to, to represent an unordered collection is to just put it in order, right? Just predefine, okay, I like alphabetic order, so I'm gonna put my collection in that. Or if I've got numbers, I like them in increasing order. Why would I wanna put them in decreasing order or some other? I get to choose, why not choose increasing? So if you, if you try to have a data structure for a set, make it a ordered, list with no repeats. Um, that's not the first time we'll use this Zen about unordered things are best viewed as being ordered. So um, we'll come back to that. And eventually I'll bring you over to my perspective on that if I haven't already. Um, okay, so we have already done an example of roster notation. Well, okay, so, so what does it amount to? If you just have a few things in your, lit, in your set, then just name them all. So I might have a set that consists of a, B, C, go, Ray, B, and one, two, three. Wow, too many humps on that three. I think my brain was starting to think about the French brace in advance. Anyway, uh, you know, nine things, I guess that's a little bit much, but you, you can, if you can write them all down, just go ahead and do it. Sometimes you have a set, and that's roster form, list everything in between French braces. Sometimes you have a set that's just a little long for that. Like, what if I wanted to have set T be all the numbers from one to a hundred? Then you, you sort of cheat a little bit. You put some, an ellipsis in, dot, dot, dots, and say where the endpoint is. So that's, a, that's also roster form, and, and everybody knows what you're talking about in there because you've, you've set up an initial pattern. It's just one, two, three, so, okay, I get it, four, five, six. That's, that's a little bit bad because sometimes what seems like the obvious pattern doesn't continue to hold, but still people use this sort of notation with an ellipsis in there to, to deal with uh, longer sets. And having done that with longish sets, then, you think, well, why not just jump to the long guest sets? What if the list goes on forever? And that's okay, you can have infinite sets. For instance, the set of natural numbers is 0, 1, 2, I guess I'll do three of them, but then dot, dot, dots, and then there's nothing after the dot, dot, dots, meaning it just goes on forever. So that's, that's also a roster form where, again, we've set up a pattern and you don't expect it to, to change. You're including every single successive integer after that. Um, there is a funny symbol you want to watch out for. It looks like the letter E. And it stands for, is an element of. You see why it's nice to have a single symbol for sort of a longish phrase. Um, you, can, you can also just, okay, so there's a short way to say it in words too. Uh, you can say in. So for instance, I could write seven is an element of the natural numbers that I just wrote down. This set. Actually seven is also in T. But it's not in S. Uh, so, so I should show you how to say it's not in something while we're here. 7, write that same element sign, but put a dash for a diagonal line through it, a slash through it. 7 is not in S. This set of um, triples of things from the Jackson 5 song. Anyway, um, 
That's what how we. I, I just need you to to be aware of that funky looking E is going to show up, and and it just means it's one of the things in the collection. Um, there's a couple of sets that we need to make sure everybody is aware of. This set N is one of them, so I'm going to leave it sitting there. And do you notice the the odd way that I wrote the letter N? That is called blackboard bold, which is a way to on a chalkboard or a whiteboard to indicate something's supposed to be a bold-faced letter. These other sets uh, I want to describe also are written in blackboard bold. So in a, in a textbook or something, you might just see them as bold-faced letters. But, uh, sometimes people actually now write them using this kind of a thing because it's, it kind of looks cool. So there's a font that you can select that creates these blackboard bold things. Anyway, R. That is the real numbers. Probably you know what that means. <laughs> but it's, it's weird that it's surprisingly difficult to say what the set of real numbers is. One approach to it is to say, well, it's all the things that have you know, decimal places, stuff after the decimal point. But um, it turns out, for instance, there's two different ways to represent every real number with decimal expansions. Well, it's, there's two different ways to, ex to represent many real numbers. <laughs> anyway, the, the real numbers, probably the best informal way to say it is they're the numbers that measure things. If you have a physical quantity, like a length or a weight, that's a real quantity. There's, a, there's another collection that's inside of the real numbers called the rational numbers. And I guess you see that the letter R was already taken for real, so they use Q for the rational numbers, which actually kind of makes sense because of what they are. The rational numbers are quotients. So they're the kinds of real numbers you can, you can write as fractions, okay? Not every real number can be written as a fraction. You, hopefully you know that. If you don't, we're going to actually prove it later. But, uh, but there are some real numbers that can't be written as fractions, like root 2 is an example of that, or pi. Pi goes on for, I think a lot of people think pi is 22 over 7, but that's just an approximation. That works for sort of engineering purposes, but not, not in general. Okay, so... And the, this sort of deal with explaining why the, the, the letters chosen or chosen is going to continue here. There's a set that's called Z, which we know, I think you know, it's the integers. And why isn't it I, since it's integers, and nobody's used I yet? It's that the person who first named them Z was German. So in German, they'd say Zal for number. And Zahlen means the set of many numbers. It's the plural of numbers. So um, integers is not this set. Watch out for that. Z, if we write it in roster form, we have to use the ellipsis two different ways. Um, it has zero, and it has all the natural numbers besides zero, one, two, three, and that goes on forever to the right. But what it's also got in the integers is the negatives. Planning. My pre-planning didn't work out so well, but you know, a string of negative numbers going off to the left, a string of positive numbers going off to the right. None of them have anything after the decimal point, so they're all whole numbers, but uh, some of them with negative signs on. Anyway, that's, that's the integers. I didn't write natural numbers here, but that's what is pretty much the standard uh, version of the natural numbers, especially in computer science, people include the natural number zero. I think I just said that wrong. Zero as a, is a natural number. But historically, people didn't use zero as a natural number. So in the textbook, they actually say something like, because of this ambiguity, we're not going to use the phrase natural number anymore, which I think is, is lame. Just grab a stance and say, yeah, natural numbers in this book are going to be zero through whatever. So. Uh, that's, that's what you should remember. The reason, in, especially in computer science, we like this is for indexing in lists. It, it really makes index arithmetic work out nicely if the first thing in a list is actually numbered zero, the zero thing in a list. Uh, 
folks who have done Python, you know the range operator that lets you create a, a range of things to, to loop through in, in a loop? Um, it always creates the range operator, unless you put in extra uh, decorations, always produces a number from zero, one, up to whatever the, the actually one less than the number that you specify, so that it's the right sort of things to use for indexing into a list. Okay, so that's our, our standard sets. Just make sure you're, you're familiar and don't get them, the ones that have that kind of uh, naming conventions mixed up. R stands for real, not rational. You use Q for rational, and ZAL and Z for integers. Don't write an I, because nobody will know what the hell you're talking about. N for naturals, I suppose, makes sense, but in, the word natural in German is also naturlich. So, yeah, I, I guess it worked. All right, uh, there is another way to describe a set, which is, um, I want to start down here, and we'll have to erase and continue, but it's called set builder notation. And in set builder notation, you don't have to just list everybody, but rather you, you sort of give a criterion for is a thing in the set. If it satisfies the criterion, it will be in the set. And if it doesn't, it won't be. So um, you'll start with, in, in doing set builder notation, you have to specify ahead of time kind of a, a, a realm that you're working in. We call it the universal set. So we'll start with a universal set S. You know, for instance, that could be any one of these things. I just kind of put it, pointed at Z twice just now. N, Z, Q, or R could be your universal set, but it could be other things. So, it, you know, it's, it's sort of up to you. We're trying to be generic right now. Set builder notation. You start with a universal set, and then let me, let me write how you actually specify a set with the set builder notation. You use French braces, just like you did for roster. You say you're going to pull things out of a set S, and this is where a variable comes in handy. X, like in the previous chapter. X is an element of S. There is a vertical bar here. And then you write down one of those sentences like we had in the last section, which is a, a sort of a mathematical expression that has an X in it. The, there's a shorthand for a thing like that. We write P of X. And then you end your, your curly brace. So let me, let me tell you how you read this stuff. When you, when you encounter a set builder notation like that, the first curly brace is read as the set of all. Then you just read that as x in s. This vertical bar is read as such that normally. And it's strange that people almost always use a vertical bar here because there's another symbol in math that means such that, which is the backwards of the element sign. Actually, it's backwards and just a tad longer normally. But anyway, that, that's the, the usual symbol for such that. Just in this one context, when we're talking about set builder notation, people just use a vertical bar. And, uh, but still, you, put, you read such that. And then P of X, remember, is one of these sentences like from section 1.1. So you just read off whatever it says. You know, that, I'm writing a P of X there just to be generic. There is actually going to be some concrete sentence in mind. Um, well, let me give you an example. Uh, let P be the set of all X in, how about the integers, such that. I'm going to sort of spec specify the P of X here with, with two things in it. Um, X is a prime number, so we could just say X is prime. And uh, how about X is less than 10? So this is kind of a longish thing, so then it involves X in two different places. But basically, I've just got two conditions. I've got to be prime and I've got to be less than 10. What's P? What's the set? Well, what I mean by what's the set, because that's what it is. It's, it's written that for you, but we can also describe it more, more accurately with, not more accurately, but more concretely. A 
to say it that way, by just listing everybody. In other words, converting the set builder notation into the roster form. What numbers are primes? A lot of people think one is a prime, but it, it for technical reasons, doesn't count. So one's not a prime, but two is, and three is. Four is not, but five is. Six is out, seven is a prime. And then that's it under 10, because remember nine is three times three, that's not a prime. So two, three, five, seven is, is the roster form of the set I've described right there. Uh, continuing on with sets, the next notion we want to discuss is uh, the idea of one set being contained in another. All right, containment is a, a denoted symbolically like this. You have a, a kind of a round version of the less than or equal sign. So it looks like less than or equal except rounded off instead of pointy. Or you know, some people say it looks like the letter C, which is kind of cool because it's contained. But anyway, A is contained in B like that. And that means that everything that's in A is also in B. Every element of A is in B. So to check that, that one set is contained in another, you take this guy's elements, list them all out, and then one by one you go through them and see, are they in there? Yes? 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 No? Okay, they're not, not, not contained. But you got to get yes on every single element of A. Uh, let's do a quick example. Suppose A has the numbers 1 and 3, and shoot, that was a Pretty bad brace. Let me try again. Still ugly. Okay. And B is the set of uh, one, two, three, four. And so writing A contained in B is cool because one is in B and three is in B. Um, I said A is contained in B. There's other ways to to say it, but let's let's try to make a little list of how to pronounce that symbol. You can say is contained in. That's the one I've already used. You can say is a subset of. And, and sometimes just to mix it up, because you, you get tired of using the same phrases over and over again, you can sort of swap the roles and talk about B first. You could say B contains A. And while we're, we're on that, I, I want to point out that just like with less than or equal, um, which this is meant to be reminiscent of, you can swap the, the order of the symbol around. It could be uh, the, the mirror image of a C. So you could have uh, B, like, that doesn't look very round. Let me try that again. Um, a silly mnemonic, a silly memory trick for remembering how the direction of these things work, and this works for less than or equal as well, is the, the symbol looks a little bit like a, something that has a mouth. So I always draw some teeth in there to help me with that. If you have an, a, a, like a hungry alligator that's standing in between two hippos, what does he do? He turns his head and grabs the biggest hippo because he's hungry. So. Uh, no, probably not, because hippos probably would kick an alligator's butt. But yeah, that's the idea. Imagine you've got something hungry. He's got two choices of what to eat. He turns his head towards the big guy. So this may look like it's pointing, but it's really pointing with its open mouth at the larger thing. Um, what, about, what about a way to say that that's not the case? That is, that A is not contained in B. Does that ever happen? Well, that would mean that at least one element of A is not in B. So I'm just going to fix this. Non-containment looks like this. A is not a subset of B. You just, again, put a slash through the symbol. And it means that at least one element of A is 
it's not NB. So as a, a quick example of that, suppose I had the sets A and B as before, but A went one farther. It has one, three, and five in it, but B was one through four. Then you can no longer say, excuse me, that A is contained in B. In fact, this is what's true. A is not a subset of B. Um, there's one more variant on this symbol that we should write down, which is, um, well, do you remember how in, in less than or equals, you also have less than, strict less than? That is less than or equal versus strictly less than. This means it's less than, but it could be equal. And this is eliminating the could be equal element there, just saying it is less than. So for sets, you would have a, just this, that part without the line under it, B, which is read as, as this. It says A is a proper subset of B. A is a proper subset of B. So the word proper, I think, is a little strange, that usage, but it just means it's not actually the same as B. It's literally inside. It's a, it's a smaller collection than B is. Um, how do you say that? Well, every element of A is in B, just like before. But additionally, there's at least one thing in B which is outside of A. That is, let's see, wait a minute. Every element of A is in B, and there is an element in B that is not in A. So there's, there's a little bit of B that's outside of A. I don't know if you're familiar with Venn diagrams. The picture would be something like this, um, where A is the inner set and B is the outer set. So all the stuff that might be in A is automatically inside the, the circle for B, but if you're going to have proper containment, there's going to be some stuff out here, too. Okay, so then the, uh, the last thing we need to talk about in this section is known as the Cartesian product. The, uh, this is named after René Descartes, who was a pretty famous French mathematician, also famous in philosophy. Um, he... He had this, this saying, cogito ergo sum, meaning, I think, therefore I am. Frequently, or almost everybody's heard of that, which I'm, I'm not a big fan of that particular saying because it, it seems like you're saying that only things that can think exist, whereas I feel like there's plenty of things that can't think, but they do exist. Anyway, Descartes was also famous outside of the philosophy realm as, as a mathematician. And uh, he's the guy who first thought of doing this, making an x-axis and a y-axis, and locating points in, in the plane by their x and y coordinates. Let's see, what have I done? Just, no, it looks like I put one, two on the board. So that, that point is located by saying, well, the x coordinate is one and the y coordinate is two, and then you figure out where those meet at the point there. Um, that makes the entire plane a set. The points in the plane are a set that looks like this. They're the set of things that have 
an x and a y coordinate, a pair, right? I picked one, two, but really we could let those guys move all over the place, such that the only, the only uh, restriction on it is that x is a real number and y is a real number. So since this is, he was the guy who first thought of doing this, the, the plane is, I mean, most often people just call it the XY plane, but really its name is the Cartesian plane. In honor of Descartes. Um, so, but the plane is not really that special. Um, you can make sets of things that are pairs where you put x in one set and y in some other set. So let's think about this where the r's have been replaced with a set a and a set b. And just to make it nice, I'm going to keep a and b relatively small. How about if a is the numbers 1 and 2, and b is the letters a, b, and c. Then you make the Cartesian product, which is this set that I've just written down. Actually, it's denoted by A times B with the cross sign for multiplication. A times B equals pairs X and Y, where X is in A and Y is in B. Well, um, what would that actually consist of? Let's, uh, let's write it out in roster form. Let's get rid of this plane and we'll do it right up here. A cross B is, well, let's see, there's going to be a bunch of things that start with a 1, and then they'll have A's, B's, and C's after them. So 1A, 1B, and then 1C. That takes care of all the ones that have a 1 in the first slot, and then um, there'll be 2A, B, and C. I don't know if I've got room to fit it on here, but I'll try to squeeze a little bit and make it happen. 2A, 2b, and 2c. And then our final curly brace. Um, make sure that if you're, if you're doing a cross b, you make the elements of a come in the first position and the elements of b come in the second position. So we always have a number followed by a letter here. Uh, it would be wrong, just wouldn't make sense to talk about b2. Right, is that would be in that would actually be something in B cross A. This is not a commutative kind of product. Uh, why do we want to talk about that? Well, the Cartesian product, just like that, with two things, is is not so exciting. But you can up the ante to things where there's like three things: A cross B cross C. And in fact, you could keep going like that. You could do dot 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 up to n. You know, the whole bunch of things crossed together. And when you do that, you're talking about the set of n tuples. So let me, let me just, uh, actually, it's making me feel guilty to write it that way. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use some subscripts. a1 cross a2 cross dot 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 cross a sub n. Now it's explicit that there are n sets multiplied together. But, but it's entirely analogous to what we did for two sets. You just make uh, tuples that have something from the first guy, something from the second guy, something from the third guy, and so on until you get the lastly thing, and something from the last guy. Let me turn this into set builder notation for us, just mostly for the practice. We're talking about the set of things that look like that, such that. Well, there's a whole bunch of things after the such that line. A1 is an element of A1, first set. I should say, and A2 is an element of big A2. And, well, dot, 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 until, sorry, we got to break the line here, until A sub little n, little A sub n is an element of big A sub n. That's a set of, of n tuples, and we took the uh, the sets as probably being distinct. There's a special case 
that we do, uh, which is known as strings. And this is something people in computer science, I think, have run into. Um, strings are n-tuples where the entries are all the same, whatever the alphabet that the strings are over. Uh, so our strings, let's say A is equal to some set, how about the letters A, B, C, all the way up to Z. And then usually they distinguish the capital letters as being different. A, B, C, keep going all the way up to the capital Z. And there's usually more uh, symbols that are okay, like the numbers and some of the special characters are okay. But let's just leave it at that for now. But, you know, strings with only alphabetic characters is what we're looking at. Um, a string is just a, an, an element of A to the N. Oh, wait a minute, no, uh, I just did something kind of bad. I talked about the cross product of, of bunches of things, but what do I mean by a power? Well, you, you mean the same thing you always mean by a power. If, uh, power is repeated multiplication, except we mean this kind of multiplication if we're talking about a set to a power. Okay, so um, that would be a string of length n with alphabet, alphabetic characters in it. Now, technically, a string wouldn't look like this with parentheses and commas between the elements. So it's, it's written without all the extra decorations. Maybe I can just make that as a parenthetical remark. Written without parens and commas. But that's, you know, that's a minor distinction. Really, what is a string? It's a word collection of, of n things. It's an n-tuple. All right, so that brings us to the end of what we need to cover in 1.2. And so that's the, the last of our stuff for today, or for Tuesday's class. And I'm actually just getting the stuff posted up on YouTube on Saturday. So I hope everybody will have time to watch it before then. Anyway, see you, see you Tuesday.